Bill DiOrio works with the state of Jordan. If you want to understand where the resource shortages of tomorrow are, a very good spot is to, to start with water. Bill contacted me last year. He had heard uh, you know, about nuclear desalination. And so uh, Bill DiOrio and I worked on a, a little bit of a paper for, for Jordan to hopefully convince them that even though it is a long-term uh, issue, that we have to get started today. I spent the last 10 or 15 years of my career studying water demands, trying to figure out how we could eliminate waste and how we could maximize the efficiency of our water use. And at a certain point, it came to uh, the conclusion you can do quite a lot through conservation, but conservation can only take you so far. Well, I started seeing the water conservation people turning into water Nazis, uh, where they were, the concept was just keep decreasing the level of service. Just if, if, if the people in Jordan get water one day a week, if we don't have enough water, we'll give them water every 10 days. And uh, that's the solution to our problem. And I say, no, that is not the solution to our problem. That is the beginning of a, a massive worldwide crisis. People cannot live uh, in a situation where they don't have a minimum available water. So that's what, I call the, that's what I call the water problem. During the 60s, Eugene Wigner and Alvin Weinberg had the idea of desalinating water through nuclear reactors and using that water in the Middle East specifically to provide fresh water for uh, municipal and agricultural uses. This is a great idea. It founded on the lack of support for nuclear power increased cost for these uh, high-pressure water reactors and uh, the politics of the Middle East, obviously. I mean, you, but maybe now, maybe now things can be different. Uh, we're at what I call the age of eco-refugees. When I look at the huge migrations of people in the world today coming out of Africa, coming out of the Middle East, I do not see ISIS. What I see is I see water and energy problems. The land is not habitable. It is not habitable. If you look at Dara, Syria, this was the birthplace of the Syrian revolt. Do you remember the, the school kids from Dara? There were six kids. They spray painted the wall. They got arrested. One of them was murdered. Uh, the police dumped the bodies back at the family homes. That began a uh, series of revolts, which were met by uh, maximum repression, maximum violence. Uh, this was the start of the Syrian revolt. Here's a picture of Dara, Syria. If you look at that place, you go, wait a minute, is this Mars? Tiny little pieces of green. You see a little stream going along uh, up to the top left corner. But generally, this is the garden spot of Syria. The families that these kids were from were farmers. I talked with the guys over there who told me that uh, the, they, their irrigation wells were shut off. So these guys went from farmers growing vegetables, selling vegetables, independent people, to paupers like that, and it became because of irrigation wells being shut off. They moved into town, became, you know, impoverished street people. Millions of people have done the same thing. Or look at Jordan. Jordan, in my way of thinking, is like the last refuge in the Middle East. Jordan has absorbed refugees from Palestine, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, its population now is over twice what was planned. They thought there would be about 4 million people in Jordan now. Now there are 9 million people in Jordan. The water supplies are not adequate. People in Jordan get water one day a week. Uh, the water's turned on and then they have a thousand liter roof tank that has to carry them over the next six days until it comes back on again. And again, the water guys over there are saying, well, we'll just we'll make it every eight days or every nine days when they get water. See, that's their idea of water planning. Power supplies are also terribly inadequate. The Jordanians get a fifth of the uh, electric capacity that we have in the United States. They have no oil, they have no gas, they import all of their fuels. They don't have enough water to build conventional reactors. If you wanted to build a water-cooled reactor in Jordan, you would have to find another supply. They're talking about using uh, recycled wastewater for cooling these Russian reactors they're thinking of building. The point is that water should be going to growing crops. It should not be going to cooling a, a nuclear reactor. The red line is the water demand that we projected over the next 25 years. This is a modest demand. 
Um, in the United States, for every uh, a unit of water that's used by municipalities, by uh, residential people, 50% of that water goes to industrial, commercial, and institutional uses. As in, like, if you look at the city of St. Louis, if there's, there's 10,000 acre feet of water going to residential customers, there will be about 4,000 acre feet going to industrial, commercial, and institutional. And there will be about 10% of that going to irrigation of parks and open spaces. So we, didn't allow, we allowed a, a very, very modest supply for residential, and then uh, maybe 10% going to ICI, and then maybe 1% or 2% for irrigation. If you look at a, an aerial photo of Amman, Jordan, there are no, you cannot find parks. Uh, there's no with kids to go for a, to a swimming pool or if they play soccer, it's on dirt. The green line here is the supply line. Now you notice the supply line can barely keep up for the next 10 years or so, and that's assuming that a series of new water projects are developed, which may not happen. One of which is called the Red Dead program, which involves pumping water from the Red Sea over the hill and then running it down into the Dead Sea, generating electricity, desalinating water, and pumping the water up to Amman. It's a very complicated project, expensive, and the, que the question is how much water can you put into the Dead Sea? Because that's the limiting factor. So what we would like to propose, and what John and I have worked on this paper, we're trying to get a place to present it. The idea of bringing molten salt reactors mobile on ships, and then taking the waste heat from those power plants and using it for uh, thermal desalination. For 1,000 BTUs, you can make a pound of steam at atmospheric pressure. A gallon of water is 8.3 pounds, 8.34 pounds. A kilowatt hour is 3,412 BTUs. So for every kilowatt hour of thermal energy you put into one of these units, you can get about 3.4 uh, pounds of steam, uh, and that's about 0.4 four gallons. You can put a, uh, a kilowatt hour of energy into a thermal desal. You can get 0.4 gallons. And that's just a single stage uh, reactor. Now this is a picture of a, of a multiple effect distillation unit. It looks complicated. The steam comes in at the top and it comes across the side and then uh, fresh water goes out the bottom. So <clears throat> if we would please lock the doors, I don't want anyone to be stealing this highly secret diagram I'm about to show you, which shows you how the, this is how it works in reality. All right. <laughs> so you put in, uh, you put in the feed water on the, on the left, let's see my cursor here. The feed water comes in here on the left side, and then you have steam coming in. All right. The steam comes in, and the hotter the better, as far as we're concerned. Uh, it goes through this first chamber that's full of feed water, which is basically sea, sea water, and then it comes out again as liquid, and then in a, a power plant situation, that water would go back to the boiler, okay? So your first chamber is basically dealing with the steam coming off of your boiler, and that stuff goes back, and whatever makeup you, you need, you get from the succeeding. Uh, this is a triple effect distiller. Each one of these units is called an effect. And in a multiple effect distiller, the vapor that comes off of the first uh, uh, chamber is then fed into a second chamber. Uh, and then the, the water, the, the condensate that comes out of that is product water. And then the third, uh, uh, the vapor that comes off of that is fed into another effect. And so each effect, the temperature in each effect goes down, right? So you're decreasing the temperature. In order to make the system work, you've got to also decrease the pressure. So you put a vacuum on the system. And so the, uh, that takes electrical energy, obviously, to, or you can generate, if you have high pressure steam, you can do a venturi, but it takes work to do that. So therefore, the hotter the, hotter the input temperature, the, 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 less, uh, the more effects you can have, and each one of these effects increases. It's almost like magical. It's viol it seems to be violating some law of thermodynamics. But if for each effect here, you, you, this, this system here will give you th three times the water th that you would get out of a single effect because you keep reusing the vapor. And so um, it's called the gained output ratio. And so you can get, with the right setup and with the high enough temperatures, you can get a four, up to 14 effects. 
Uh, so for every pound of steam in, you can get 14 pounds of water out. So the advantages of doing this kind of linking between the water and energy is that the thermal desal units can use heat that would otherwise be wasted to the atmosphere and generate fresh water. And roughly, the rule of thumb is that for every 100 megawatts of electrical energy output, you can get about 10 million gallons of water a day of fresh water. So if you have a 1,000 megawatt electrical uh, generating station, you can get 100 million gallons of water a day. That is a lot, that, that's a significant amount of water. That would make up Jordan's water shortage for the next 30 years. The plant that I'm showing you here in Abu Dhabi, they make uh, 400 million gallons of water a day with an output of 4.6 uh, megawatts of electrical. It's the largest thermal desal plant in the world. Seawater comes in to the plant through this large channel and then they discharge the concentrate with about twice the concentration level back into the sea where it's diluted. The blue line here shows for the public service company of Colorado a typical summertime electrical energy demand. Green line shows the maximum that occurs between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon. This, this does not include any wind and solar that happens to come online which would make the effect even worse. So the idea here is rather than ratcheting up and down the power plant output, you use the ex excess power, put it into your desal plant, because we don't want, we don't want 600 degree uh, heat. You know, you can, you can run it through if you've got a chemical uh, processing or liquid fuels, go ahead and use it there. We, we want somewhere between 100 and 200 degrees centigrade uh, heat coming out. But, the point is that you, instead of throttling your power plant, you make more water. Molten salt reactors are ideally suited to this operation from, from what I can see. They operate at high temperatures. They don't require water for cooling. The only water that, would be co that you require is wake up water for the boiler feed, right? But the actual reactor itself, does not, you're not, you don't have to be dealing with water there. Uh, they're passively safe. We've heard this, we know this, we believe it. Uh, the heat from the reaction uh, goes to secondary heat exchanger and generates steam for power and water. Again, the only wa makeup water is for the boiler, which comes from the desal product. So the economics of this project actually worked very well. Uh, we figured a thousand megawatt power plant <coughs> would generate up to 6.3 million kilowatt hours of electricity and 112,000 acre feet of fresh water. Capital costs $4.5 billion. Matt, have your attention, please. Uh -oh. Matt, have your attention, please. This is the hotel emergency dispatcher. We have an alarm condition, and we are investigating the nature of this alarm. When we have determined the exact cause of the alarm, you will be notified. Okay, nothing can go wrong, folks. Okay. So the bottom line of this is that even though the capital cost would be about four and a half billion, the annual cost for operation maintenance and capital recovery about 465 million, but the income from the water and the power would be 850 million. So that's a benefit cost ratio of 1.8. So that thing works. So what's the holdup? Uh, there are no molten salt reactors on the market. Uh, the work being done by private companies, to my way of thinking, is slow and poorly funded. Get on it, boys. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy does not appear to be actively promoting development. Uh, I mean, uh, John and Jim's experience is more an accurate t uh, testimony to that. Uh, it looks like most of the work is being done in other countries, such as Canada, China, and India. Uh, so, but I just want to close by saying, that the thing that made the personal computer take off was not the magnificence of the 8086 processor. It was WordStar and VisiCalc. It was these compelling applications. And desalination of water is a compelling application. And my mission in life is trying to convince other water engineers that we need this. We'll never forget it. If you're going to try to run a civilization on windmills and solar cells, forget desalination of water. You forget even pumping water. So we really need to get this done if we're going to continue into the 22nd century with any kind of, uh, any kind of civilization. Okay, okay. Have your attention, please. May I have your attention, please? Sorry for the false alarm.
<laughs> okay, so uh, any questions? I guess there's a few minutes. Yes. Have you ever made a comparison of what we're spending on the military to fight terrorism in conjunction with what it would cost to maybe have the other governments fund a MSR for water? Well, that's a good question, but just think about it. If we, if we, can build, if we could build a plant in Jordan for four and a half billion dollars that would basically take care of their water and power needs for the next 30 years. How much would a war in the Middle East cost? How much have we spent in Afghanistan and Iraq? The trillions of dollars that we have spent going down a black hole. Military spending does not increase the GDP of the country in which you're, you're bombing. Uh, this would actually increase the GDP of Jordan and the Middle East and increase the standard of living. So I think it's a no-brainer. Yes? I was just curious, you said you needed 100 to 200 C. What makes an MSR special relative to a light water reactor that operates at 300 C? By the time the steam goes through the, uh, gener the, um, the turbines, the light water reactor, the feed water might be coming out of 300 degrees C, but there's not enough waste heat uh, uh, available for the D cell. The stuff that comes out the, uh, the end of that the big uh, tur the Rankine turbine is that uh, the steam is you know, it's condensing. And so it's very hard to make a, the only way you could do it, if the plant was operating at maximum output, you would have very little uh, waste heat left over, just a tiny bit of the condensation. But during that, even that, that if you follow the load curve, and that during the times when the electrical demand is down, even on a conventional light water reactor, you could bypass steam and use that, uh, that steam for making yeah, that's what I thought you were doing, is we're using the non-max load of time. In this case, it doesn't matter whether it's MSR or... You're not using exclusively the max, uh, the, that difference. You, you're using a combination. If you have a, a, an MSR where you're operating at 600 degrees C and you have this high temperature uh, uh, heat supply, not all of that needs to go to electrical generating at any one time. So in California, we're building this... Uh, Big uh, Carlsbad down there. Yeah, yeah. 40 megawatts. Right. About, about. 40 megawatts. And it gives 7% of San Diego County's water. How does that compare to using, they use membrane to out. How does that compare energetically to what you're supposed to do? When you're using uh, reverse osmosis, yeah. you're using high grade energy, high grade electrical energy. Uh, and you're right, there's 40 megawatts, and it seems, I can't remember, they, they, their, yeah. their output is about 18 million gallons a day. So it's about 16 or 20 kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. And here we're talking about what, two or three. So this is about an order, almost an order of magnitude less. If the desal plant costs four to five billion and the MSR... No, it's the whole thing is four to five billion. Well, if it costs three billion and the MSR costs 1.2 billion, it makes more sense to dedicate the power plant to only run the desal because the desal plant is the biggest capital cost. It was about 50-50 uh, between the two. But the point is, we want the electricity. Uh, they need the electricity, too. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you.